Ready or Not has finally released. This co-op game puts you in the boots of an underfunded and overworked SWAT team. Starting out in Ready or Not can be daunting, with the variety of missions, seemingly endless equipment choices, and numerous commands for your teammates. What I intend to do is guide you through these elements of the game in a series of videos that will hopefully put you on the path of taking down bad guys and saving the day. In this first episode, we'll be discussing your loadout. But before that, if you haven't bought the game and want to know why I think you should, I did a video explaining exactly that. In short, it's the most realistic police game on the market that's also a fun to play first person shooter. At its core, Ready or Not is a shooter, but it's unique in one key way. In almost any other shooter, your goal is to shoot people. In Ready or Not, the opposite is true. The mark of a successful mission in this game is minimal casualties, both that of civilians and suspects. When you go through a mission, you'll receive points for completing various objectives. These can range from securing civilians, neutralizing suspects, and collecting evidence. For breaking the rules of engagement, you'll be deducted points, so don't do that. Based on how many points you get, you'll be graded with a score at the end of each mission. The more objectives you complete, the higher your score will be. There's one important note about this scoring system. If you kill anyone, you won't be able to get the coveted S rank score. So, when you're starting out, don't worry too much about getting the highest score. Rather, focus on being able to consistently complete levels. As a SWAT officer, you'll be operating primarily in the city. Cramped houses, Cluttered offices and sprawling warehouses are just some examples of the locations you'll find yourself in. So, our gear choices are going to reflect where we operate. We'll start with the gun, because I know it's the one you all care about the most. When choosing a weapon, our most important consideration is length. Open door left. That's clear. Come on. Let's go. 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 Take it. Take it. In ready or not. The length of your weapon will affect how well you can move. With a longer gun, it'll be more difficult to maneuver the weapon in tight spaces. This can inhibit you from bringing your weapon up quickly to respond to a threat. And with how close some of the gunfights in Ready or Not can be, those tenths of a second can be the difference between life or death. For that reason, I usually avoid extremely long guns or extremely long setups of guns. On the other hand, Many smaller guns in Ready or Not fire pistol calibers. Against a poorly equipped violent criminal, these weapons will be more than adequate. However, more dangerous criminals will wear body armor. Pistol caliber weapons will struggle against armor. A rifle will do a much better job of penetrating body armor and taking suspects down. Your fucking hands up. For this reason, I generally like to use carbines. Some of my favorite choices include the G36C, the Mark 18, and a new F90 bullpup rifle. But functionally, any short rifle will perform more or less the same. Of course, this will depend on the mission. If I know I'm entering a small house with poorly equipped thugs, I may opt for a small pistol caliber carbine such as the MP9. If I know I'm going on something akin to a military raid, and know I'll go up against well-funded criminals with body armor, I may opt for a battle rifle such as the SA-58 OSW. This brings me to an important point. Read the mission briefings. They'll give you an idea of the types of criminals you'll face. Take this description for example. It notes that the suspects are well-trained veterans, so I definitely would bring a rifle on this mission. For weapon attachments, it'll once again depend on the mission and your preferences. Optics are generally personal preference. I like using the EOTech because of its large window and circle within a dot reticle. Foregrips do reduce recoil, but they don't have a huge impact. Since you'll be using semi-auto 99% of the time, recoil reduction isn't too important. What is important is your accessory slot. Most of the time, I attach a flashlight and bind the on and off key to a mouse button. This allows you to turn your light on and off quickly. If I'm doing a raid with night vision, I'll switch the light out for an infrared laser. 
so I have another way to aim on their night vision. In regards to pistols, bring whichever one you want. I've almost never needed to switch to one, and usually opt to sacrifice pistol mags for more primary weapon ammo. The exception to this would be when I run a shield. In that case, I bring as much pistol ammo as I can carry. With this in mind, let's move to your other gear slots. Your headgear is going to depend on what mission you're going on and how you plan to approach it. If you want to go in guns blazing, a ballistic face shield will protect your face from small arms fire. If you plan on executing a raid in the dark, night vision will be the way to go. Don't forget to also attach an infrared laser on your gun. Infrared lasers are invisible to the naked eye, but visible under night vision. So you can aim your gun and point out enemies and things of interest without alerting the enemy. If you want to incapacitate a room full of suspects without killing them, use the gas mask. After throwing CS gas grenades into a room, you'll be able to walk into the room without feeling the effects of the tear gas yourself. <laughs> Moving on, you have your body armor and plate carrier. Armor obviously protects you, but will also slow you down. There are three general types of armor material in the game. Kevlar, ceramic, and steel. Kevlar is the lightest type of armor. Its weight, or lack thereof, allows your officer to move very fast. However, Kevlar offers the least amount of protection of all the armor types. Kevlar is best used on small maps with little to no suspects. Ceramic is the middle ground in armor. Its weight is manageable, and it offers much more protection than Kevlar armor. Ceramic is able to stop all pistol rounds and most rifle calibers. However, it is slower to move around in than Kevlar. Steel is the heaviest type of armor in the game. It offers the most protection, stopping all types of bullets in the game. This advantage comes with one big disadvantage. It's heavy. Its weight means that you'll move extremely slow in this armor. Quite often, you'll find yourself too slow to move out of harm's way, and will have to rely on your armor stopping incoming rounds instead. As with most gear in this game, pick the one most suited for your mission. However, if you're unsure, you can't go wrong with ceramic. It will protect you from most threats while still allowing you to move quickly and with confidence. There are three sizes of armor plate carriers you can choose from. A stab vest, light armor, or heavy armor. A stab vest offers 15 slots of equipment, but also has the least amount of protection. Light armor allows you to bring 13 slots of equipment and provides some more armor coverage. Heavy armor offers even more protection, including the groin area, but only 11 slots for equipment. I usually prefer the heavy setup, as I would rather give up the extra slots of equipment for more protection. However, this is going to depend on what role you play in your team. Since I like being the point man, I like having the extra protection. In regards to ammunition type, it's quite simple. Hollow points are more effective against unarmored targets, while armor piercing rounds are effective against armor. What requires more nuance is how much ammo you should bring. It can be tempting to load up with the max amount of ammo and mag dump every target you see. This is very fun, and on some missions, can even be an effective strategy. However, on most missions, you'll probably need less ammo than you think. This is important, because your equipment slots are for all your equipment. If you bring less ammo, you'll have more slots to bring other equipment. For example, you'll be able to bring in more grenades. Flashbangs are one of the most useful pieces of equipment in the game. Being able to stun suspects in a barricaded location can even the odds in a gunfight and result in apprehending a suspect alive. You also have tactical equipment to bring. These vary greatly and all have a specific purpose. The Optowand is one of the most useful pieces of equipment in the game. It allows you to look under doors and around corners. Being able to see exactly who and what you're dealing with is invaluable. Always have one of these on your team. 
The following three tactical equipments all revolve around breaching doors. The breaching shotgun is capable of shooting open any locked door. It allows you to breach a door from a distance. This is useful when breaching a door that's booby-trapped, since you'll be able to safely breach and detonate the trap. Also, breaching shotguns will usually only leave the door slightly ajar, allowing you to throw grenades into the room. One thing to note, the breaching shotgun is the only shotgun capable of shooting open doors. The regular primary weapon shotguns cannot breach doors. The battering ram is also used to breach doors. In comparison to the breaching shotgun, it's quieter and doesn't rely on ammo. Compared to the shotgun, it also impacts the door with much more force. While a breaching shotgun will destroy the lock, the battering ram will ensure the door will fly open, allowing your team to move in faster. And finally, the C2 breaching charge. It combines both the advantages of the breaching shotgun and the battering ram. Place this explosive on a door and detonate it from a distance to blow the door completely open and detonate any traps instantly. The breaching charges have two major disadvantages. 1. They are very limited in use compared to the battering ram and breaching shotgun. At most, your team will only be able to carry 4 or 5. The other disadvantage is that anyone close enough to the explosion will die. Each breaching tool has their advantages and disadvantages. What you bring will depend on your mission. Ideally, you want every breaching tool available so you can choose the appropriate one for the scenario. Moving on to other equipment, we have the door wedge. This is one of the most important pieces of equipment. It allows you to block off a door, letting you contain all suspects in a room. It also lets you block off doorways where suspects could flank you. On maps such as Brissa Cove, they are essential. In this game, the Taser and Pepper Spray serve similar purpose. Use them on individuals who are unarmed, but not complying. In real life, Pepper Spray and Tasers have different use cases. But in Ready or Not, they seem interchangeable. Lastly, there's the Shield. The Shield is a great tool for your point man. It will cover most of your body, and will stop most types of bullets. Being able to tank incoming fire is a huge benefit, but comes with several significant downsides. While holding a shield, you'll move very slow. You also will be limited to using pistols while holding a shield, and with a shield, you'll only be able to push open doors as you walk through them. The shield is best reserved for your point man, who will enter after a door has been breached but in that role, it's extremely effective. Now that you have your loadout set up, practice with it. Doing missions is the fastest way to get comfortable with your gear. There isn't a 100% correct loadout. It's going to depend on your playstyle, tactics, and mission. Even in real life, police forces across countries, states, and cities have differences in their equipment. Experience and teamwork are much more crucial to your success. So find some friends and start playing the game.